Hi everyone, welcome back. Today I am here with James McCosh from Toru Tech, who's going to tell us a little bit about himself and his work experiences. Um, and he's got some advice for our upcoming graduates as well. So, um, James, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and your company and what you do. Um, cool, thanks, Kendra. I am a uh, software engineering graduate from the University of Waikato and I've um, pretty much worked locally in Hamilton for, for most of my career, apart from a couple of years over in the UK. But um, yeah, I've got a lot of experience in Internet of Things, um, tracking and that kind of stuff. And uh, in 2017, me and a couple of other graduates from the Waikato, uh, you know, Waikato University Engineering Department um, started our own company called Podutech. Um, so our first product there was a product that we created called The Guardian. Basically, it's a it's a financial uh, sorry, facial recognition system we use to help to uh, help problem gamblers exclude themselves from venues and prevent relapses where they basically they they want to be excluded from a venue but they they can't resist the temptation and come back in to gamble. So how it works is that there's already existing legislation that allows a problem gambler to issue a self exclusion order, and these orders are done through a healthcare provider. So. Previously, where we saw the opportunity was that there was uh, an existing paper-based system, and that's where the the game, gaming venue, like a pub or club with pokies or a casino, would get sent through a, um, a paper, a photo, or a photo of someone with some details, and basically that just got pinned up on a board at the back of the venue where the staff had to remember these faces, and then um, and then as people came in, if they were the same people on that board, they were then asked to leave. Obviously, when you've got 60 faces stuck on a board, it's a bit tricky to try and remember that, especially when you maybe have a lot of staff. Yeah, yeah, when you've got a lot of seasonal workers, it can be pretty pretty hard. So um, it also limits the number of venues a person can be excluded from. So if you think of a place like Gisborne, where there might be sort of eight or nine different venues, if you can only be excluded from one or two, because that's physically how many people um, someone can remember, uh, it doesn't, the system doesn't work very well. So what we came up with was a product that would allow healthcare providers and the Ministry of Health currently um, has, has sort of looks after the, uh, or owns a database that we use for this to make sure there's no privacy issues. Um, we, we store these people in a secure database and then have a facial recognition system that checks people against that database and then identifies if that person's a problem gambler. If they are, a staff discreetly just ask for some ID and then suggest they probably shouldn't be there. Um, and those those incidents were recorded, and it's it's had a, a very good effect. We've got a lot of buy-in from the healthcare providers themselves, and across the industry. And so we started off in just pubs and clubs, but now we're across uh, five casinos in New Zealand and Australia as well. And we we also do a bunch of other things like uh, engineer things, based products, optimization and logistics, solar energy monitoring. We we try and keep our um uh, our different we keep across a few different verticals just so that if something like COVID happens and uh, all the pubs and clubs happen to shut, for instance, then you've still got some backup revenue coming in from other places. So what skills have you had to pick up from um, with working from home and kind of what challenges have you faced with that as well? Um, to be honest, it probably hasn't been as much of a step change as you'd think. We, we've obviously all been working from home, but as, a, as an IT company, it, it, the, the biggest change is just not being in the office near other people. I mean, Personally, my biggest challenge was when school and daycares were shut. So balancing childcare and work was definitely tough. But now that schools are back, and it's, I actually can't tell you how much easier life is. It almost feels like a bit of a holiday. Um, the there definitely are challenges, such as uh, the biggest one for me is probably the impromptu to the ones you wouldn't think about, like the impromptu chats with colleagues and just being able to sit next to them to work through something. Um, technology obviously helps. We use Slack for messaging, um, we use Teams for voice calls, meetings, screen sharing, but it's still not quite the same as actually physically being there, talking to someone, especially when um, when some of your staff work in areas of poor internet and cellular coverage. So we, we try our best to um, to manage around that though. Um, if, if I had to pick one behaviour I think is most important for dealing with remote work, it's probably ensuring that we communicate regularly with teammates. And this, this applies for on-site work as well. But when you're off-site, it's almost out of sight, out of mind. It's easier to overlook people that might be sort of sitting there silently struggling with something that they could be easily helped with when you're not having those random chats around the office. And um, even if it's just a lot of um, just social chats, being able to catch up with people regularly. So, yeah, the key thing for me has been 
making sure that we stay, we all, we're talking to each other, we're communicating, we just, we're all open and the information's flowing between everyone. Cool. And do you find that's been working pretty well for your team? Yeah, I think so. I think the team's been um, performing really well. So I've been really, really pleased with how everyone's going. I'm quite proud of the team, how they've, how they've handled this, um, this situation. So James, what would your top three tips be um, for, for a new graduate who's being interviewed in this post-COVID world? Um, I think the, the key thing for me is to be yourself. So your interviewers aren't necessarily looking for someone who's just the absolute smartest or knows the most about technology. What they want is more of a package. So your CV sort of tells what you've been working on, but the interview is more to see how is this person going to fit in as part of a team. The interviewers will usually be looking for someone who's confident and comfortable talking about themselves, but that doesn't mean that if you're an introvert, you need to suddenly become an extrovert because the, the interviewer is going to be able to tell if you're, if you're trying to put on a fake persona. Mm -hmm. Basically, the interviewers want to get a feel for how you interact with other team members and clients. And it's unlikely that the people in the interview are going to try and break you or make you feel bad about yourself because that's just not a nice thing to do. Um, feeling nervous is, is natural, but try to think of this as an opportunity to demonstrate your knowledge and why you'd make a great, great team member rather than I'm just going to go in there, I'm going to be embarrassed or I'm going to, I'm going to feel bad. Um, if you seem comfortable, your interviewers are more likely to think that you're that well to situations the workplace throws, throws at you. So just almost think of it like you, you want to be prepared, so don't come in too blasé, but at the same time, think of it as more of a chat amongst potential colleagues rather than these good cop, bad cop kind of, uh, kind of scenario. Um, the other thing I'd say, and, and this helps with the first one as well, is prepare. They are going, interviews will usually last at least an hour and there will usually be multiple of them. So before you go into an interview, even if you've been told it's non-technical, make sure you've brushed up on your technical knowledge. If the interviewer asks you about common in industry concepts, like say continuous integration, dependency injection or whatever, even if you haven't used them, the interview will go a lot better for you if you at least know what they're talking about. And this also applies just to the company that you're having the interview with. Um, if you go in there knowing what the company does and what they sell, they're going to be a lot more impressed, uh, impressed with you as if you go in there and you just have no idea what, what the anything uh, idea of anything about the company um you should be able to find all this in line but if you can't try your best uh, i've i've gone for interviews with companies where they they literally have no online presence and you sort of sort of just got to try and guess what they do but uh, but at least you can sort of see that they've that they'll usually understand that as well um you should also come prepared with a list of questions for the interviewer um things like what tools they use how the developers work together what kind of work they have in mind for you what kind of support and professional development will be available for you? It just shows that you've got you've got something you're thinking about um, how you're going to fit in with this uh, with this workplace. If if I ask do you have any questions for us and you say oh, no, it sort of shows that you haven't really thought about things too much. So I definitely yeah, make sure you go in there knowing what you're going to talk about and being very confident in your ability to to be able to answer the questions that they throw at you and. The third thing is be cool. And what I mean by this is you'll occasionally get thrown a curveball in an interview and you just need to deal with it like any other question. For example, and this is this is something that happened to me, like you've you've um, you've prepared for the interview, you're quietly confident that everything's going well, then the interviewer throws a random question at you like, how many petrol stations do you think there are in New Zealand? Or what's 57 times 63? Um, these these questions are designed to see how you deal with an unexpected situation. I, I don't use them personally because it, it just feels a bit weird. <laughs> but one place I was employed at, and it was a really great workplace because some people I've, I've heard some developers say, "Oh, if a workplace asks me those questions, I don't think that's a workplace that I work, want to work at." But it was a really good workplace, um, and the whole point of them when I was talking to the guy asking me them later was to see how you deal with something unexpected and also to see how you think. Often the interviewer is not uh, after a precise answer, like 57 times 63, they want you to know, and the, the company that asked this was actually a, um, a financial company. They want you to know that 57 times 63 is about 3,600. They've had people that say, oh, it's 36. Or they've had people say, oh, 10,000. And they're just throwing out wild guesses, but not sort of thinking logically about it. When you're dealing with um, a financial services provider and you're dealing with money, 
getting a number wrong and not recognizing that it might be up by quite a bit is obviously quite a bad thing. So um, basically, if, if the interviewer asks you a random question, or even one that's just a, a normal technical question you just have no idea of, try and think it through logically. Um, don't try and BS them, because that won't get you very far. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but just try and, if, if possible, try and talk through your thought process and how you're attacking the problem. As long as you don't panic and think carefully and logically through the problem, you'll probably be okay. So then, um, James, what's 57 times 63? <laughs> <laughs> it's 3,591. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to answer that in an interview. I, I only do that because I remember it now. <laughs> That's awesome. I, and for the record, I did get that right, and I, and I did get the job. Nice. Good work. Those are really awesome tips, and I completely agree with you, particularly around the one um, coming prepared with questions. I always like to ask what the employer is looking for because – um, you know, you might know off the bat that they say, oh, I want a person who can work 70 hours a week and you're sitting there going, I'm going to work 37. So <laughs> <laughs> you immediately know it's not a match. But yeah, definitely exactly. doing your homework and coming prepared. Really good tips. Um, how important do you think that networking um, internally and externally, um, just on the relationship side of the business before and during COVID and obviously moving forward, um, yeah, how important are these things? Uh, they're, they're just as important as they were before the pandemic. I mean, networking is pretty critical in any business, or and and you can almost think of yourself as a business as well. If you're if you're putting yourself out trying to sell your skills to to a company to employ you, you're representing you're representing yourself. So it's maintain getting relationships with people, maintaining relationships with people are, are really important. It's it's a little bit harder during a pandemic pandemic when it's harder to maintain uh, when you're trying to maintain these relationships and you can't meet face to face but that just means you need to put a bit more effort in um, for for our business is especially important for social activities because you want to maintain a bit of a culture in your in your company and one thing that we we did before the pandemic is every Friday the whole team goes out for an outing on Friday we there's a, a coffee or drink shout and we just have a basic team meeting catch up and um, just get out of the office and that's pretty easy when all you need to do is just pop down the road to a different cafe. But when everyone's locked inside the house, you need to get a bit more creative. So um, what we ended up doing is just every Friday afternoon, we, we all Skype together, or um, teams, as it were, and um, yeah, have a, have a bit of a chat, see how people are doing. Um, one of the guys puts up a list of, of, of non-work related questions about how, what, was the, what was the first level two activity that you did, um, what's the thing you miss most from lockdown, and uh, and yeah, just have a bit of a social chat. And then after that, we um we sometimes play a few of their uh, like online games. Like uh, I don't know if you heard of Scriblio. It's one where you've sort of got to draw something, and everyone else has got to guess your drawing. So yeah, just just a bit of a way of getting everyone around, having a bit of a laugh, and just maintaining that social connection. And um, with external suppliers, it's the same. Like you you need to maintain those relationships with your clients, your suppliers, and it's just. In the end, it's a lot about just picking up the phone and having a chat to them. Because often for us, a lot of our external um, external partners uh, are in a different city anyway. So to, it hasn't changed a huge amount. It's just that you've got to go to a bit more effort to maintain those, those networks. That's awesome. Um, those are all my questions. But I guess last one, if there's anything that you want to say to our grads or, or the students coming through the programs and, um, yeah, any advice you've got to share or anything like that. It does come back to those. To actually, actually, here's probably the most, the most um, good advice I can give you. When, when I first came out of university, I was fortunate enough to be, go through the engineering program and I, uh, speaking of networks, knew someone who is my current uh, business partner who um, got me a job somewhere else. So I never had to sort of interview or anything for, for a, a job. But when I left that job a couple of years later and went over to the UK, I arrived there at the beginning of 2009, which is not too long after the GFC, and it was about three months after all the banks there had laid off about 30% of their IT staff. Yeah. So that meant the job market was pretty saturated with IT workers and there weren't a huge amount of jobs. So um, I basically, after, after touring around Europe for a little while, set about sending out my CV. I must have sent out 
hundreds of CVs and never heard a response. And as an employer now, I can see why, because you receive so many CVs, you can't personally respond to each one unless you're actually thinking about hiring them. The, the thing I would advise is don't get disheartened, keep trying, because you will get a job eventually. And it, do, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're, it doesn't actually go to the, the absolute smartest, the PhD students, all that. A lot of it is just how you'll fit in and showing that you'll work well in a team and also being a bit passionate about, passionate about what you do. Um, yeah, I say I, I spent a month sending out CVs. I eventually got two job interviews uh, after uh, an on-the-phone interview about C++, which was probably the worst interview of my life, which I, where I didn't know half the questions. Um, but yeah, they, they'd actually been looking for about two or three months and they'd interviewed some pretty good candidates. But the thing that got me in there was that they felt that I would be a good addition to their team, that I, they could sort of, you know, joke around a bit in the interview, um, show that you've got a per, bit of personality. And that was, that was it. So yeah, uh, my advice, we have been here before. This isn't, this isn't a new thing. There will always be ups and downs in an economy. So just keep trying. Don't, don't get your head down and you'll be all right. That's awesome. That's really good advice and an awesome story as well. Um, definitely, yeah, it makes you appreciate the probably the path that some people have got um, mm -hmm. and the hard work that you do have to take as well sometimes to really land that job. So well done. <laughs> it's obviously set you up pretty well for what you're doing now as well. Thank you.